Um, I do want to give thanks real quick to all the folks who've helped put this together. Um, there's a lot of volunteers who've come and, and offered their time and expertise in terms of putting together the sound and equipment. And Big Nerd Ranch has also graciously loaned us their offices, which is where we're currently meeting. And the folks who showed up to uh, ask questions who are here in the crowd, uh, thank you for coming. Um, so with that said, um, yes, we're here to talk about that. We're going to take a take a step through each of the panelists and we'll let you speak a little bit about yourself uh, and maybe speak to what your awareness of is of Senate Bill 315 and maybe what your concerns are or your thoughts, your initial impressions are. So we'll start here. Okay. Hello. Uh, so my name is Xavier Ash. Uh, I've got um, 25 years in experience in the security field. I've uh, been a practitioner, a, a security consultant, researcher, a little bit of everything throughout the years. Um, currently, I am uh, you know, running a security uh, consulting company uh, out of Ackworth, Georgia. And uh, uh, so I had uh, you know, a lot of concerns around uh, the you know, culpability and, and uh, uh, around the you know, people I work with doing the different security research. So. Um, Look forward to talking about that aspect of it. All right, hello everyone. My name is Lane Timms. Um, I have been working in this area for about 18 years across software and IT and cybersecurity. Uh, PhD from Georgia Tech in electrical and computer engineering. I currently have been working for the past six years in vulnerability management. So, uh, in terms of vulnerability discovery, this bill has a lot of interest in uh, myself and my colleagues. Um, particularly concerned with some of the vague language, uh, as well as possible uh, business impacts that we could have in our community. My name is Kate Bennett. I uh, also have a degree from a uh, master's degree from uh, Georgia Tech and ECE. And I, my concern about this bill is data protection. I feel more comfortable knowing that there's many people with uh, security knowledge out there helping protect my data by protect. Uh, submitting to companies issues that they find with the websites that the companies own because only the companies that own the website or can can actually fix it so by not reporting it doesn't mean it doesn't exist it means that other people could find it and maybe other people who we don't want to find it so that's my concern and I, I've been in the security industry for over eight years now Excellent, thank you. So I think one of the things that we might want to do for our audience, and, and if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask on Facebook Live, and we'll definitely get those uh, over to the panelists, is to just recap real quick what is Senate Bill 315 and why it might be of concern. So I think we skipped that a tiny bit. Does anybody want to take a stab at explaining that to the folks who might be watching us? Sure. I'll take a first stab at it. Uh, the reason that the bill exists uh, and, and is that Georgia is one of the few states that uh, does have a gap in its uh, coverage of what is illegal when it comes to doing you know, different bad things with computers. Uh, so in specifically, uh, you know, Georgia did not have something around you know, unauthorized access of computers. Uh, basically, you have to go and you have to uh, cause damage. You have to uh, you know, do something that you know, uh, covers some of these other laws that currently exist, but un unauthorized access uh, and, and, and some of the nuances around that. that so that's the reason that, this, this, you know, that the legislators started down this path and covering it. Uh, and and uh, the reason that we're here is, is that it's really hard to, to be able to outlaw what we want to get outlawed without stepping on the toes of the security industry since a lot of what we do in the security industry can be considered unauthorized access, uh, that, that, uh, but the reason that we do it is to find security uh, vulnerabilities, like I mentioned, uh, uh, find uh, you know, uh, situations where there's uh, in, in inadvertent disclosure of information. So, uh, so the, uh, the bill's original intent is, uh, while good, uh, has really kind of missed its mark in, in being able to uh, you know, cover the gap that we need to, but uh, leave the protections in place for those who do this on a, a daily basis. Yes. That's okay. Anything you would like to add, to, uh, either of you, to Kate or Lane? Are we just discussing what's in it, or what's yeah, yeah, yeah? What's what's what's, what's in it exactly? Like, so what what is the impact uh, for for the average person who may not be aware of what the bill is doing? So for the average person, if you accidentally go to a web web link that's you know open to the public and you weren't supposed to have access to it even though you do have access to it then where does the bill come into play in that instance um, 
honestly, it probably, it, it could go to court and you would probably be found not guilty eventually, but then there's potential loss of wages and reputation and all this other kind of stuff. So that's for the just the average user. For the uh, someone in security, where we're, you know, we have legitimate business reasons for testing different things. Let's say open source technology, or or we're or we're reselling components of uh, something that was supposed to be certified. Let's say a flash component or even a processor. If and honestly, we need to be testing that before we deliver it as a full package. Now, could where does the bill leave these things? It, I don't think it really covers everything that that it, it needs to in the way that it's written. So what I'm hearing you say is there's a, I'm hearing you say that there's a gap there uh, between the protection that we would like to see the bill provide and what it would actually provide for Correct. for the public. So what are your what are y'all's takes on the impact for let's say the research community? How how would the research community be impacted by this bill? And and as I understand it, the bill is saying that uh, anyone who accesses a computer a computer network um, with knowledge that the access is without authority would be guilty. They could go to jail for up to a year, right? Or they could see a fine of up to five thousand dollars or or possible probation. Um, but there are some there are a couple of carve outs, and I'm curious as to how the research are those the research community covered by those carve outs? So are they going to be protected so they can still do the work to discover uh, uh, vulnerabilities and then and then issue patches for those vulnerabilities? It it could be that. I mean, you're covered by the company that you're wor you work for. Now, are you covered by these other companies? And that's the the big question. The NDA agreements have to be much more precise and have these kind of statements that say, "Oh, you cannot send anyone, any of our employees, to jail for discovering anything that's found on." And I'm not sure that NDA agreements currently cover this level. I mean, usually when we find security, I work for Nagravision, by the way, and I sort for into it. When we find issues with our uh, vendors, um, either hardware or software, we let them know because we want them fixed. We don't we don't say, "Hey, let's get into a, a court war of you know whose fault it, fault it is." We we just want the issue fixed. Can you go into more detail what you mean? So where you say that there are other companies may, where you may run across a vulnerability. Uh, in the course of your work, maybe maybe you can't because you <laughs> you had signed an NDA, which uh, I think for Correct. folks who are maybe not in the industry that stands right. for a non-disclosure agreement. Correct. But yeah. uh, maybe you could give us a hypothetical example that would be close to what you might see as a typical. Um, oh, uh, Heartbleed. Heartbleed was a good example. It was Heartbleed uh, for the folks? So um, there was an issue with the um, Heartbleed is. If I remember correctly, it was uh, replicating data to make sure that your servers were never down. And I forget exactly what that issue was, but at one company I worked for uh, a long time ago, we used that software. And had we known that there was a security issue then, and we and we could have easily found it. This was back in 2006, which is probably why we didn't find it. We have much better security testing now. But um, if we had found that and we reported it, then where does that fall in? It's actually, uh, and I'm not sure that this bill covers these kinds of things. Legitimate business needs to be defined. Like in, in Florida, um, there's actually a section that's called definitions. This is, I'm referencing Florida uh, chapter 815, computer related crimes. There's a definitions uh, listed of offenses. So it would be really nice to, if we could have something that says definitions. Um, and also in the offenses, it says, with let me read the exact because I don't want to misquote. It says, um, it, oh, sorry. Um, it says, uh, basically, oh, sorry, I can't find it. Uh, oh, it's basically the intent or purpose to deface the company or the intent and purpose to cause harm. Yeah, that's one of the things that we know is right. not addressed in the Correct. Georgia version of the bills. There's not anything right. addressing intent. Right, and the Florida bill does, and I'm sorry I can't find it at this particular moment, but if we could copy that, even copy what Florida did and put it in the Georgia bill, then I think that would be, you know, the obvious intent of a company to find a security vulnerability would be to fix it and to protect people's data and not cause harm to 
to others. Yeah. Do you mind if I add to that? <clears throat> so she mentioned this vulnerability called Heartbleed. Uh, there's other, uh, there are many vulnerabilities that uh, security researchers discover on a daily basis, but some of them are, you know, you can take note of, like Heartbleed and Shell Shock and many others that are very, very highly impactful vulnerabilities in terms of if malicious actors find these vulnerabilities and exploit them, uh, that has a huge impact on us in society. Um, but a lot of these vulnerabilities are found by independent security researchers who might not actually be doing pen testing or uh, vulnerability discovery for a company. And so to me, that's a huge problem with this. How, how, how big, um, could, Heartbleed was something I heard about. And, and for, the, for the folks at home, uh, my background is not security, but uh, as an application developer, that's the day job when I'm not uh, serving the folks in 119. How, how widespread was the impact of that? Because I, I think folks may be missing the magnitude of some of these issues. They might not realize how large and widespread they can be. Could you speak to that? Yeah, so Heartbleed was an information disclosure, disclosure vulnerability, if I recall. Um, literally impacted virtually every server on the internet. I mean, I would not go far out from saying that any server that was running uh, some type of HTTPS was most likely uh, so impacted. So a website in general, anybody yeah. serving a website. Yes, and to, you know, when I said HTTPS, this is the, this is the secure portion of HTTP. So like when you go to your bank, you're running over HTTPS, you do not want any of that information compromised. So, um, yes. Very, very impactful. So to set this up, if, if an independent uh, researcher were to have come across this, um, and uh, that independent researcher lived in Georgia, or they, dis they discovered this on uh, you know, a company that was running in Georgia, uh, after this, if this bill gets passed, that independent researcher now has to think about the legal ramifications of notifying uh, that now they've, uh, poss that they've possibly broken the law and that by reaching out and doing the right thing of telling the company, telling the vendor, telling the, the, you know, the, the community that we have a vulnerability and that we need uh, to get this addressed, uh, now they will you know, probably not do that disclosure. Um, and so uh, independent researchers, um, uh, a lot of which uh, I work with and you know, I've done uh, myself, is uh, you know, uh, there are ways of, do, of getting you know, paid for that type of research work. Uh, there's a lot of programs where you know, go to companies uh, and you say, hey, I found a, a vulnerability in your site. Uh, and they will, you know, the companies will pay for that and say, thank you for helping us and, 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 and pay for that research. If, if they can't get their work paid for on a legal basis by going to the company, there's always you know, there's the black market that that vulnerability can then be sold to bad guys. Uh, and now uh, we have a situation where the intent was to help secure Georgia companies and uh, inadvertently has now made Georgia companies less secure because of this bill. And I think there's some, some companies that are actually setting up programs for proper disclosure. They're sort of saying, this is how you tell us you found the vulnerability in our software systems. I feel like um, Dropbox is one that I've seen in the news in the last month or so. I talked about that, I believe. All the larger companies do, but how, how widespread is that practice? You know, having a, a disclosure, uh, proper disclosure for uh, problems with companies. Like, what 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 do you do as a security researcher when you find a problem and you say, okay, th this is a problem. Uh, I can see there's a vulnerability with this website. What's the next steps? <clears throat> so um, there are certain mechanisms in place. For example, bug bounty programs. There, are, I forget the name of the companies that are doing that, but. Uh, Hacker One, yes, Hacker One is one of them. So those have in you know actual mechanisms in place where you they actually the, these companies will say, <clears throat> come try to hack my system, and if you find a vulnerability, we'll even pay you for it if if you find it under these various instances. Um, in terms of other companies, let's just say Microsoft. Uh, if you own a Microsoft software and you can use, a, say, a black box approach where you just try to probe it and try to find vulnerabilities, you can actually, Microsoft has a mechanism in place where you can report said vulnerability, uh, and many other companies are like that. When you start talking about, say, smaller companies that may have uh, web services or websites and such, I would say the vast majority of these do not have any type of security mechanism in place. And even smaller, the, the vast majority of the world does not have a security mechanism in place. This is kind of, uh, we've been doing this for years now, you know, we've made a lot of progress in security, but in terms of 
uh, companies having security procedures in place, it's still a very, very small percentage. Security is a cost factor, not a profit factor for most companies, and that's why they're oftentimes not interested in security. The Internet of Things, the IoT, is a scary, scary thing right now. It's beautiful technology, but the, the percentage of these things, the devices and software that are actually secure, I mean, almost hardly any are, because they need to build their profit, I mean, their products and software fast and get to market quick. And so security is of no interest to them. And so um, you could actually see some uh, company, uh, say an IoT company that's just getting started that has no interest in security, potentially abusing a law like this to, um, you know, come um, fight back to or, you know, cause problems for researchers that are probing their products. So if I'm hearing you all correctly, and, and this is sort of, um, there's a lot of uh, unpaid work that goes on to f find vulnerabilities, share vulnerabilities in the community to help one another for the folks who are, who are I think, have integrity and ethics. Those, there's a lot of that work going on. Um, is that a correct understanding of, of how a lot of these things get solved? Uh, a lot of the vulnerabilities get um, discovered or? Um, you know, the, the process of which, um, you know, if you're a security researcher, independent security researcher, uh, you know, and you're going out to find these to, you know, pay the bills, you know, that, that's what your, your uh, expertise is in. What you're going to do is, is you know, e either contract out with a, you know, with a company and where you've already got that agreement, like I said, you, you get in the NDA, you've got a contractual agreement to go and, 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 and probe their systems. Uh, but very often you're, you're probing um, lots of different software that's kind of like off-the-shelf software. You can go download some of this. A lot of it's open source, uh, free to download, free to use, um, and uh, and and if you find vulnerabilities there, you know the amount of you know use of that is is pretty high, and therefore can go to the various companies to work with and and get you know funding for finding that vulnerability. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, then you're saying that in the course of a contract with a particular company, you might discover vulnerabilities with the tools that they're using. But those tools may be widely used. Other people may be using those tools. And then all of a sudden, those other people may be vulnerable as well. You can't tell those folks. Is that because of the NDA? Or why would you not be able to tell those folks who are also using those same tools that they've got some problems that they may not be aware of? Um, actually, often you can. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, sometimes it's the particular usage of a company's way that they're using that tool. Um, uh, it's, it's very highly modified, and, and so therefore, uh, they just, imp the, the, their implementation has a vulnerability. And so, um, uh, but that, uh, you know, if, they're, if the software is still out there being used by other companies, uh, then, you know, especially if it's open source, then you can be able to, you know, work with the community and, and, and provide that information, get the software changed so that the community can be, uh, you know, healed in that manner. Okay. So I think to bring it back a little bit to the research side of things, one of the things that maybe I'll touched on is that there's a decision point that as a researcher you may have to make. Should Senate Bill 315 uh, receive the governor's signature or should he not sign it and it become a law, which is what would happen in Georgia? So he has to be very explicit about vetoing it. So there's a decision point that a researcher may have to make where that could lead to maybe them not disclosing information. Okay, so what about for the, what, what's the impact for, the, for me as the person on the street? What is, what, is the, what is the impact on both the short term and the long term? So um, recently I discovered a vulnerability in a um, genetics website, which is probably the last thing you want to discover because you cannot change your genetics. Anyway, so I was just using the site like a normal user. I honestly forgot my password, so I clicked forgot password. They emailed me the password I'd used in my inbox. <laughs> okay, this is not good. <laughs> um, so I knew Can that- you go into detail why, why that's bad for folks who may not be uh, um, experts well, or you, aware? Well, you, it should be that your password is encrypted in the database because it, if they're able to email it to you, then they probably did not encrypt it. That's one. Secondly, um, email is not known to be the most secure way of communicating. It can be if you do something like PGP encryption. Uh, that that was not done. It was just emailed me to, to my Gmail. So now Google can see it as well as anyone else who happened to be on the Wi-Fi network or just what, you know, lots of people could have <laughs> seen this. Thankfully, it was the only time I ever used that password. 
good recommendation, by the way, for for anyone. <laughs> um, so what I did was I replied to the guy. I said, this is a major security vulnerability. So then I just did a quick look at some of the other things on the site. No un un unauthorized access, just using what I should have had access to as a user of the site and uh, put together a list of the things that they needed to fix. And in the last comment, I said, please do a complete delete of my user of the data in the database, um, which they went back and said that they would. So <laughs> that was a relief. But that is, I never, I did not ask for money. I just wanted my data, especially my genetics data, protected. So that's, um, and when that, would that be illegal with SB315? Possibly, they could have come after me for saying I, I tested their system. <laughs> Another aspect of this that um, we should we should uh, talk about is that we talked about the companies that um, are are welcoming the researchers, saying that we know that you know sometimes we make mistakes, and that you know there's this you know infrastructure of of, of you know security researchers around the world that can help out in, in making sure that we uh, have the most secure systems, and so uh, but. That's not all companies, and not all companies, you know, have invested in that. Um, and some companies are not as friendly to the for you telling them that they have a, a security problem, because, like you said, it's a call center. They're going to have to fix something. There might be legal ramifications. There might be, uh, uh, you know, this might be a huge risk to their business. And so, uh, the um, the vendor or the company and and in, in, in now uh, or if if this company if this bill gets signed, now has the option of contacting the police. That the, instead of going and fixing the problem, you know, or you know, calling their lawyers and suing them, they can call the police and have a security researcher arrested uh, for trying to improve the security of their, of their technology. That, sound, that sounds incredibly chilling. Yeah, so uh, Lane, did you want to speak to the longer term impacts? Did you have anything you wanted to add for the average person on uh, how they may be impacted by this bill? <clears throat> Uh, longer term impacts, um, this could definitely de uh, uh, start reducing our overall security. As, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the vast majority of vulnerabilities um, are discovered by people outside of a given company that might have a product. And so if these folks stop, uh, especially the ones in Georgia, stop doing this, then overall we'll have a reduced amount of security because the bad actors are out there looking as well. So they'll find them and then they'll, <clears throat> they'll use them for their own profit and motives. Uh, the other thing uh, in terms of the long term is, is, is a bill like this could definitely potentially uh, impact um, our business community in terms of companies looking to come here. And for me, that's very concerning. Uh, but in the long term, you know, uh, less folks working in security is definitely nowadays with everything becoming computerized, with everything becoming connected. This is not a time you want to impact people that are trying to make that technology better. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's great. That was what, one of my questions that I wanted to touch on was, what is the impact for the business community? And so maybe y'all could take it a little more personal. Uh, we've been talking sort of in the abstract a little bit, but um, you know, could you speak to what the what your what your experience has been with the growth of the security industry in Georgia and what you've seen it, what you've seen it when you first maybe moved here or when you started getting into the industry, how much it's grown, um, and then and then. And speak to maybe a little bit of what Lane, and you can add some more if you'd like to, as to what you could see the impact being going forward uh, should this bill not be vetoed. So I can start with that by, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I was, uh, you know, employee number one in a startup here in Atlanta, um, uh, Drawbridge Networks, an information security uh, company. And so um, we had a, a, a team that uh, we had a couple folks in New York and a couple folks in Atlanta. Um, and we wanted to grow our Atlanta team because the resources are here. There are great security uh, folks in Atlanta. Uh, it's a great market for finding those talented individuals. Um, you know, fast forward, if this we were in that situation, if I'm in that situation again, where we are deciding where do we build up our technical resources uh, in a bill like this, uh, we would decide to build that security team in, in a state not in Georgia, right? They're coming out of Atlanta. And so, therefore, you know, that decision, we made a decision to, you know, move to move our, our uh, grow our team in Atlanta versus New York. And that would be a decision we'd go the other way after this bill's passed. 
questions. How, how, how easy is it to do that? Now, that's one of the questions that I think um, that I've heard asked in the past is um, oftentimes companies, uh, they see legislation that they don't like. They'll say, uh, you know what, if this goes the way that I don't think it should go, we're going to have to make different decisions. Um, and so I'm curious as, as how feasible is that uh, in, in the security industry for, so for somebody to say, yep, yeah, we're not going to continue to invest in Georgia. Is that something that's easily done or is that difficult? And you know, what, what sort of other considerations would you make when you make that decision? I believe that, you know, it's, it is, uh, you know, really according on the size, uh, of the, of the company that we're talking about, but that in general, uh, the work that we do in security can really be done anywhere. So the mobility of the workers here, uh, is, is very high. And so if I had a security team, uh, you know, in place and, and, uh, I wanted to continue, keep those individuals, but reduce my uh, legal liability, uh, I could easily offer, you know, uh, them to move them to another state. And, and uh, it would be a fairly low cost. Uh, it's not like uh, shutting down companies or anything. It's just access to the internet uh, and, and having the, the people in the right place. And, and so it's, uh, security is one of those hot markets right now. Atlanta's got a great, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and Georgia in, in general has got a great uh, history in, in growing that community. Uh, but this will definitely chill that as we see more and more companies, uh, small and big, uh, decide to, you know what, I think we're going to invest our, uh, uh, time and money in, in building that security team elsewhere. Caitlin, do you have anything you want to add? Yes. Uh, I went to the Georgia Tech career fair yesterday and I noticed that there was, um, many more companies looking for security, uh, many in, in the state of Georgia. Many, um, I went a couple years ago and security uh, you know, as I'm a security specialist. Are you guys hiring? No, no, we need to get the product working first. That We want developers. That's what everyone said. This year, they said, you're in cybersecurity? Please come talk to us. Um, so they were actively looking for more cybersecurity people. Uh, if anyone's looking for a job, that's a heads up. Many companies are looking now. Uh, and it was all over the state. Uh, Carrollton, uh, Warner Robins, uh, several in Atlanta. Uh, Georgia Tech has a cybersecurity lab. So I'm not sure if they would be exempt because they are uh, funded by the state. I know that many people who work there are very concerned about this bill. And they have written letters also to the governor about this bill. So that would, you know, it would, if I'm looking at going to jail or paying $5,000 by just doing my job, that certainly does, you know, make working from home in another state, <laughs> uh, Florida, for example, <laughs> um, a little bit more appealing. Of course, if it doesn't pass, then Atlanta is a, a super nice city. Uh, so <clears throat> when I was in college and first started considering security, I remember that I said to myself, I'm going to work for ISS, Internet Security Systems. And uh, by the time I finished, ISS was bought out by IBM. And a lot of the colleagues that I currently work with came from ISS. And so I ended up working for a company that had ISS people there. So it was the equivalent. Uh, at that time, you know, security was, you know, a growing, I would say growing in Atlanta. I don't know the numbers. But now it's just booming everywhere. So from business and, and the whole spectrum, from analyst to engineering, consulting, product development, you name it, the whole shebang is here in, in the city. And then from an education perspective, as you mentioned, Georgia Tech, uh, they've got a number of security labs. GTRI, Georgia Tech Research Institute, has a cipher lab, which is for security. Uh, Georgia State University is currently firing up a new uh, security program, highly collaborative across the business school and various things. So there's a lot of, and this this is a program that's just starting at Georgia, Georgia State. Um, Kennesaw has an information security program. We have a few of our colleagues that have gone from there. So um, this could, you know, it could impact business, university, you name it. So uh, definitely these things are, you know, we, we really need to consider it deeply uh, from that perspective. And the other aspect is while it is very easy to move individuals uh, to, um, you know, decide to, to, to put those in, in different states, um, when you go and, and look at investing in, uh, you know, expanding your, your corporate footprint and you look at, uh, you know, expanding and, and actually putting in office buildings and, and, uh, and saying that we're going to start expanding into this market, um, you know, the risk of, of you know, legal liability 
is is evaluated, and you know this is sending a a, a pretty uh, you know it's a mixed message to those you know technology companies that know that we've got all this great talent here in Georgia and they would love to be able to tap into that, uh, but if this is kind of a, a you know omens to come of, of more and more uh, in legal entanglements and just doing you know day to day security work, you know that 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 will uh, you know those those three, five, ten year plans, uh, you know, they're going to look at investing those in, in other cities. And so not only will it, you know, have an immediate chilling effect, uh, but I think that we will also see some uh, some big dollars decide to, to move into other states. Yeah, that's um, that's uh, so definitely a concern that I share. I, I'm, one of the things I'm worried about is if we're, if folks are growing at the small companies, um, but they decide not to grow because there's too much risk there on an individual level because there's not maybe a large company who could protect and support them should they stumble across a situation that uh, would put them in the crosshairs of this bill. Uh, then who are those big companies hiring five and 10 years down the road? Yeah, that's, um, I, I'd like to, we've, we've talked about the, that, that sort of chilling effect they would have, um, but I'd like to maybe turn our focus a little bit to one of the provisions in there, which is um, that, uh, sort of sanctions active defense measures uh, defense measures are, are also known as hackback so um, if one of y'all would be willing to speak to what that is exactly maybe explain it for the folks who are watching uh, as to what hackback is um, and then we could dive into why that may be of concern or maybe maybe you don't have concerns and, and if y'all had some conflict here that'd be fun too uh, some maybe some disagreement but if but touching and going into a little bit why that why they're what that provision could mean for Georgia Start with that. So um, the, you know, the 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 language here, you know, cybersecurity active defensive measures that are designed to prevent or detect authorized uh, computer access. So this this idea that there's some type of active defense uh, uh, implies that you are, are, are reaching back out to whoever you're defending from. And that's where that term hack back comes from is, is that, you know, I've detected an attack and so now I'm going to go and do something back. Now, a lot of times that is, uh, you're, you're, you're just collecting information. You know, you're, you're going to go and scan uh, that IP address and see, uh, you know, what's going on there or, or do some other just reconnaissance to help understand was this a real attack or is this something I need to respond to so there are situations uh, many of those situations that are very benign and so uh, I know that that was the intent of, of putting this language in here is to to understand that there's just certain times where unauthorized access is okay because I need to know enough information to know whether or not I'm being you know that this is a real security incident or not uh, the problem is is that there's like like we noted before in the definition sections of this article uh, it not include any type of uh, definition for this and so it is left up to uh, the, the prosecution and, and judges to figure out uh, and and really kind of has that slippery slope of being able to enable some pretty you know uh, ugly behavior uh, either by people that are just looking to you know skirt the letter you know uh, uh, skirt the law and, and be able to use this as, a, as a, an excuse to do bad things um, or uh, you know uh, just kind of allowing you know those type of you know a gray area uh, attack you know hackbacks to occur and that just over time it just gets it gets worse and worse so I think it's a very troublesome uh, bit of language and that uh, you know that it, the security industry in general has been very vocal that we should not be allowing this you know like I said from small companies to, to large uh, to give them that type of um, you know legal shielding to be able to do that yeah this is something that I think Google and uh, Microsoft they released a letter saying this was one of their concerns did, did y'all have something you would like to add uh, to f around that particular topic does it it sounds a little bit almost like revenge to me. And I don't know, I would never say revenge is a, a good method of <laughs> handling things. Um, one, because it could have been an honest mistake. Um, I, I'll give an example of that because it sounds odd, right? So as a pen tester, I will a lot of times create a, a large file just full of uh, letters and numbers. And I copy that to put it into a field of a website I'm testing for the company I work for to, to make sure that the field is protected to make sure nothing um, the website handles it correctly um, on all on all accounts so let's say you know I happen to be 
oh, I, I needed to check something uh, on the vet's webpage. To, I, I need to log in and see my cat's medical records because it has to be done before five. And I accidentally hit paste thinking I'm pasting my cat's microchip number, but instead, oops, I pasted the test data, which is just a bunch of um, characters. I'm very much more careful if it's confidential data, but these, uh, these characters of just numbers and, and letters. Oops, I caused a denial of service because they hadn't protected that field. Because they hadn't protected that field, their entire website went down. Now, could they hack back at me because they found my, oh, it came from this address. She said this. I mean, that's, you know, I would have then told, wrote to them, called them immediately, say, hey, I'm sorry, I took your site down. Um, this is how I did it. Please restart your server right now. And then here's the steps to correct it later. Um, but this is honest mistakes like this, I think, do happen. And there's many other examples, too, that I can't think of at the moment. But I, I just don't think revenge is the way to handle things. <clears throat> Once again, this could be just an issue of just not having the right technical people put the language together. Uh, active defense is not a bad thing. So it's actually the core of my dissertation was active defense, but it wasn't in a hack back perspective. It was an ability of, okay, you're monitoring your networks, you see cyber attacks happening, you put active controls in place to stop you know, the damage coming in. And then you can distribute that information in the form of what we call nowadays threat intelligence. So you can actually say, hey, I, I saw this thing you know, doing damage to my system, I've put mechanisms in place to stop it, and then you send this, that information uh, off to your um, collaborating networks or partners or whatever, so that they can actually implement those controls to prevent that type of an attack. So once again, it's not necessarily that active defense is bad, but when you read it in the terms of hackback, it's not good. Well, the fact that it's included as an exception here of saying, this type of unauthorized access is okay. You know, is the, is, we imply that they m really mean hack back because if it was just active defense like we understand it, you wouldn't need to add it to this bill. And so the fact that it's in this bill kind of shows that, that the, what they mean is, is that we can now do unauthorized access because it's an active defensive measure. And, and that's where, you know, this is a, really a, a Pandora's box. I, rem I remember, um, maybe 10, 20 years ago, talking to my relatives who were maybe less a little, little less experienced with computers than I was and talking to them about the dangers of clicking on links and that might, they may get in an email and what that could do to their computer and how that might allow a Trojan horse in there. And they were like, well, what would happen if that, if that happened? And I would say, well, you probably would turn into an email spam relay where people would be then sending out a bunch of spam from your computer. And so I think one of the things that, that I'm hearing is if, if we're the, the, the work of uh, attribution of who is responsible for a problem would be something that's a little bit difficult. Can you all speak to that and how that might play in with uh, Hackback? Sure. Uh, so what he's, he's speaking of here is that, you know, when you go and, and do something on the internet, you're, you have, uh, you're coming from an IP address. It's like when you send a mail, you've got this return address. And so that is what a lot of us in security, when they see an attack come in, they say, oh, it's coming from this IP address. They're the ones that did the attack. But the, like you mentioned, uh, that, that might be the place that the attack originated but it might not be, you know, that person's server, the, the people that own that IP address, it might not, they might not know that they're, you know, being used to send this attack. And so for folks to be able to then enable this, uh, you know, a, a, a hacking back uh, will cause undue harm on, you know, individuals and companies that, uh, you know, are unwittingly part of this attack. Uh, we saw this um, you know, uh, about a year or two ago with a worm that went around and attacked Internet of Thing devices, you know, our toasters and our, our, our thermostats. And they became part of this network, this botnet that went out and did all these attacks. So I do not want a Georgia company attacking my house because my thermostat was part of an attack. So this this legalizes that and that that's, that's a very sad state of affairs. Do you have a comment from the Facebook So Dr. Andy Green said in the Facebook feed, adversaries will typically compromise a system in order to launch attacks from. The idea of active defense or hacking back could cause innocent systems to be unfairly targeted for offensive activities. In other words, attribution is hard, yo.
Um, the other aspect of this is that makes it interesting, and 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 is is, is the aspect I wanted to get to is is on, you know, second page of the bill for us to have it printed out. But it's it's the scope of this. You know, we keep talking about Georgia companies or Georgia uh, people that that uh, uh, live in the state, uh, but the the way that this is counted out is that basically it says of a you know a computer a computer network. Um, so basically, if the packets from one from the attacker to the attackee goes through a Georgia you know network cable, they could be criminally liable. And so the 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 scope of this and all of the you know dangers that we talk about isn't necessarily scoped down to just Georgia companies or Georgia uh, individuals. Uh, you know, and so with you know having a huge footprint of level three and uh, all sorts of, or L3 and other communication companies that we you know uh, that it might have a chilling effect on the expansion of using Georgia as a conduit for sending you know network traffic if, if they have to avoid uh, you know being you know having legal liability just by not routing through Georgia based networking equipment uh, you know also is something that should uh, should be looked at. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is the company who is hacked uh, or the, the agent who is doing the hacking, they may not be in Georgia. They, neither of those parties would be, it's possible, would be in Georgia at all. Is that correct? That's correct. And and think about the undue you know resources we're we're going to ask our our um, you know prosecution and our, our our police to go and and you know go after this type of uh, uh, crime. Uh, this is not something our Georgia you know prosecution team should be handling. And I think that that you know that, that there's an undue uh, impact on you know trying to have uh, our state try to police the internet. That's not what we should be in. So, so it sounds like all of a sudden Georgia would be responsible for <laughs> the rest of the United States helping them out and, uh, and, and and trying to solve their their hacking woes as as well as our own. That that brings up an issue that or an aspect of this issue that I've always wondered about. Uh, we talked about attribution being hard, very difficult to know who is the ultimate source, especially if people are using decoys. Um, how often in y'all's work do you see uh, do you see? Where, where does it seem like the the attacks come from? Are they typically originating from IP addresses, return addresses that would come from inside of Georgia that you would expect to free, be from in Georgia, or are they coming from Florida? Or are they coming from you know? What, what do y'all see when you when you see attacks on maybe the networks or uh, systems that you've been responsible for helping to protect or strengthen? Um, really from all over. I don't know if I've ever really seen any data that says <laughs> Georgia's got a lot of, you know, attacks coming from there. China, Russia, um, all over the UK and, and such, Canada. Um, I mean, they're really all over, but, you know, China and Russia is where I've seen a lot of attack sources coming from. I want to speak as to why... I want to speak as to why they're from China and Russia is they uh, China and Russia do not have extradite uh, extradition policies so they will not extradite hackers back to the United States whereas Canada would in that same scenario just because I see it coming from China it could still be coming from Georgia yeah. but bouncing across multiple hacked nodes once again the attribution problem it, the other aspect of this is to answer your question is that more often we're seeing the the orig originating source be from a cloud provider so amazon uh, microsoft uh, you know uh, ibm those those cloud services what they do is is they put up servers all over the world and at any point when you go and access uh, or or see data coming from a particular ip address you don't know where they're coming from and, and uh, as, as we've got other parts of the world trying to regulate data uh, in Europe, to so say, you know, data that resides in Europe, we're starting to get the cloud providers to start letting us know where our data is and our servers are. Um, and so if we're trying to figure out, is this, you know, server, is this service in Georgia, part of Georgia, that's a very hard thing to do uh, with cloud services. Whoever it takes us, please repeat the question. Dr. Andy Green says, asks, are any of you bothered by the same household exemption carved out? So the question was, are, is anyone up here on the panel bothered by the same household exemption that's uh, in the carve out section? So 
I think to, to, to set the stage and then I'll let you all address any concerns, uh, there's there's four classes in this bill for folks who don't have it in front of them who are exempt from this. Uh, one of the one of the ones that we already spoke about was the cybersecurity act of defense. Another one would be uh, people who are members of the same household. Uh, so uh, the way I understand that would be um, uh, if I'm in that, in, let's say I have a, uh, a a relative in the household, a, a, a spouse or a child or uh, a, an aunt or an uncle or someone, and I need to access their systems, I would be able to do so, uh, and I would not be subject to criminal prosecution under this bill. So would y'all like to take that? Um, I actually think this would make divorce court much more fun. <laughs> if you can. So if you, if you see someone on, uh, I, I've watched the divorce court a couple of times with my aunt. But, um, so you see exactly what date did the person move out and exactly what date was the computer accessed. And if the computer was accessed the day after the person officially moved out, then even though the computer might have been left there <laughs> for a couple of days. And these are the kind of, and, and because there, it was an argument, they're, they're probably highly interested in making some kind of legal case against this other person. And... Yeah, I've I've have uh, some friend a friend who practices uh, law, and he says the most vicious law is uh, unfortunately yes. folks involved in, in, in uh, family law. Family law, yeah. yes. So that that's one concern. How it's um, it could it's not specific enough. Um, another con and another concern is that um, you know, I set up my parents' computers. They're in Alabama. You know, did they give me access? Sure, they want it to magically work. <laughs> that, that was, I don't know if that's enough access. If I asked them, uh, sometimes they'll say, what password? I never had, I never had to give a password. <laughs> so there, we get into situations like this. And that's just a, a basic example. There's many more. So I haven't really put much thought into this particular one, but now that he's asked and I'm thinking about it, this is going to actually be pretty, pretty nasty. If you consider, you know, when you say members of the same household, I assume family members, but it, does it also mean that you're living there? So what if you've got a fiance or, you know, let's say yeah, that's living with you who has some really evil, you know, things they want to do and they, they install, they, you know, in it, you know, they, un you know, they access your cell phone with, without author authorization and add some type of tracking software or something on there. Um, I'm just giving an example. So it, it could actually lead to some, some bad outcomes. I think that, yeah, there's, there's definitely two, two aspects of this is, is one is, you know, uh, assuming the spouse or some type of like, you know, uh, parent to parent or, um, or uh, adult to adult relationship, um, you know, there's the situation of, of extended family. I, I, you know, I live in a, a multi-generational home, so I, it's, you know, household is, is, a, is, a, is a, there's a lot of people underneath my uh, roof. But that, um, the other situation is, you know, so you as parent to child and, um, and, and understanding the ramifications between, you know, this does not say parent to child. So is it okay for now for my kids to access my my computer systems without uh, uh, without authorization? So that's the, that's a, without more uh, you know uh, definitions around this exploring this. Uh, um, it is again a situation that is fraught uh, for you know uh, with the, you know the possibility of abuse here and and uh, um, and and just because uh, somebody is you know living under the same roof, uh, they should not necessarily have to give up their you know uh, um, privacy and, and and right to uh, have you know that that technical device that that they can have protections from okay so there's a follow-up question um uh, a couple of sure. you want to do the microphone no i'll give you kid so he, the, he asked any thoughts about people in abusive relationships living in the same household getting a pass and the original Senate version had precisely that language about parents' children that you just mentioned. It was broadened to be the, the whole house. So thoughts about that. And then I will add personally, there's also concern about elderly parents, you know, who may not be have all their faculties together. Do you are you still in the same household with your adult parents when you live separately? 
Okay, so I, th I heard a three-part question yeah, there, three <laughs> um, and I'll do my best to repeat it. And feel free to correct me, Frank, if I don't get it quite right. Um, the first portion was uh, what would be the ramifications if there were uh, a, an abusive relationship in a household. Um, the second one was that the point that there were, uh, in the Senate version of this bill, the language initially specified parent to child, and then I think this expanded version came about in the final version of the bill that was passed by both house, both chambers. And then the third piece was um, if you have a maybe an elderly parent whose mental faculties um, have waned or, or, or they're suffering from some, from some mental illness, um, and you technically don't live together with them anymore, um, but yet you're starting to become responsible maybe for more of their uh, for, for more of their care from a remote aspect. So do you, does, would anybody like to speak to one, two, or three of those situations? I would say, um, well, my parents do have all their faculties, and they still prefer me to set up their passwords, and all their, they would like to click the Facebook um, icon on their phone and have it to work. Um, and I think I, I've heard my other friends say the exact same thing. Um, and so I, I don't see why we would get into some kind of legal, you know, drama over these kinds of things. Yeah, I think in that case, they would probably say that, that you have their full, that their full uh, uh, authority. They're giving you full authority to act in their interest. But I think maybe the question becomes, if they're no longer able to grant that from a, from a legal standpoint, that becomes a little more but tricky. But it's also if the police just ask them, did you give her the password? No. <laughs> they might still say no because they didn't they asked me to set it up I set it up I didn't necessarily give them all the details on how I set it up I just said hey you know it works beautifully on your tablet you just click here and so if someone was to ask them did they give the did I did uh, they give me their password no um, so it's possible also they they asked me what the password is <laughs> you know um, I'm thinking of the scenario in which you know police are called out to a situation, to some type of domestic situation where between parent-child, between two adults, um, or you know, with the elderly. Um, and the police generally have to make a call on whether or not you know, a law has been broken. They're gonna try to help, but they have the confines of the law. And so what this is doing is this is giving them another decision point, is that you know, if somebody makes a claim that they have accessed, you know, uh, you know that uh, that that's, you know, that, that this basically takes away that opportunity for that policeman to say, uh, you know, I don't see signs of abuse, you know, I, I don't see a legal reason to get them in for abuse. But if you know, if you were to say to that, uh, you know, is that you know, they made that claim and, and and this you know was vetoed, that you know you could you could you know have that policeman have a good reason to, you know, pull somebody out of that situation. And so, you know, basically arguing that, you know, that uh, by not having this clause in would give the police more options to help, you know, uh, uh, deal with domestic issues. Lane, anything to add? No? <laughs> okay. Um, so I think, I'm not sure if there's any aspect of the bill that we haven't touched on yet. I think there was a, another clause that talked about legitimate business activity, but just sort of taking a step back from the discussion that we've had so far in this forum, uh, I think one of the things that, that I can draw out is that there's a lot of nuance, a lot of complexity that maybe we in the legislature didn't have quite enough time to appreciate. Um, and I think we're getting close to wrapping up. Maybe there are a few more questions if they want to get in. Please get those questions in. Um, I see that, that Frank raised his hand, so we'll definitely come back to that. But while, when he asked that question, also be thinking about um, maybe some final statements that you want to share. Uh, what is your position on this bill? What would you like to see happen going forward? Just be giving some thought to that, and, uh, and, we'll, and we'll take this question real quick. Yeah, so the question is from Andy Clark, is there a way you would define access that would make the bill workable? So the question, just to repeat in the mic, is there a way that we would define access in a way that would make the bill workable? Yes, access, comma, with malicious intent, comma. <laughs> that would be, <laughs> I, that would make it much more acceptable to me. Do you want to drop the mic after that uh, one? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think she has a very good point. I think that, um, you know, when we started, 
you know, and, and we we've worked with the legislature, and a lot of these you know uh, these these exemptions were put in through the, the legislative process, and I think that we've made some really good progress from the original uh, and and to add these in, um, but that um, you know uh, we just need to do a little bit more work and making sure that we have the right exemptions in place, um, and so uh, you know. Being able to have some type of, of intent uh, language, um, and uh, and also making sure that uh, folks that even if they're not intending to do harm, but are still intending to uh, find the exploits as part of a security research, uh, that those are exemptions. So I think that's the the you know the is, is not only just making sure that we have um, you know a clear definition of of access that is. Uh, um, similar to other states, so that you know our our legal system has <laughs> less uh, paperwork to do with, but that uh, also that we have the you know the proper exemptions in place to make sure that uh, we uh, continue to allow Georgia to be you know a, a great place for security companies. There was one part of the bill that I don't think we covered as much is uh, the two the the punishment. And so accessing and defacing are equivalent in this bill, whereas we do have currently have a law that says you can't a access someone's computer and start making changes that would be harmful or deleting data. And so now we have that, which is also, I think, a $5,000 fine. Or, it's a felony? Oh, okay, so it is different. Oh, okay. I still think it's, it's a very harsh punishment for the things that we've been discussing. That, that brings up a, a topic I think we discussed a little bit with a, uh, before we got started, which is uh, for the folks who may be non-technical who are watching this, what is a great way, what, is there an analogy or a metaphor, a way that we can frame this that would help them appreciate? Because when we're talking about computers, I know that one of the things that I struggled with when I first started getting into computers, which I didn't do until college, was uh, that it can be a bit abstract, right? It's, there's, not, there's not a physical, something you can touch and feel, you're working with bits and bytes. Uh, what it would be your take on the best way to explain this to somebody who may not have the experience that we have of working in this field? Um, and if you want to touch on that while wrapping up with some closing remarks, then, then we, I think that would be fantastic. Anybody can take it in any order. Okay, sure. Um, you know, I've, I've looked at a different number of analogies here. I think that, uh, you know, the thought of, of, of a library, right? Internet's like a, a big public service where there's a lot of things that you can go and, and just go up to and pull the book down and, and take a look at it. Um, and then there's times where you need to go and talk to somebody and say, hey, I'd like to go, you know, I'd like to get that book, please. And if that person reaches up, grabs that book and, and gives it to you, you have that assumption that, that you can, you're allowed to look at that book. Um, if that person made an error and gave you a book that you're not authorized to, to, to view, uh, then, um, uh, you know, this is, this is the situation in which we're uh, looking at ourselves, being able to uh, have individuals that, you know, by accident uh, um, or as, as designed to help test security settings, you know, are going to just be doing basic requests. We're just talking about accessing systems. It's a very simple uh, thing to do, uh, but that, um, you know, uh, uh, by, by um, you know, having this law, we're basically exposing the, uh, the uh, individuals, uh, the individuals, uh, security researchers, um, and just, you know, um, putting a whole lot of, of legal ramifications on something that should be fairly uh, straightforward. So that's where I went with the, you know, the, the library analogy. I think that, that that kind of may help out some in, in trying to understand what we're talking about here. So does that, you guys think of a, a better one that, or, or something along those lines? I would say, I, I give another example, uh, maybe two examples. Uh, let's say you, you go into town and you go into a store, the door is open, they're open for business. Uh, you go into the store um, do you have access? Are you authorized to access that store? Uh, could they sue you for trespassing? Um, potentially they could if they, if they wanted to abuse um, their situation or the scenario or the language, the law, whatever. Another situation is consider this. Let's say you have a car or a truck. Uh, nowadays they're all computer controlled. Okay, um, Who owns that truck? You, when you buy it. Uh, who owns the software inside of that vehicle? You, or the car manufacturer. Well, nowadays, actually, it's not. It's, it's, it could be the car manufacturer. 
So let's say you go buy a module, a uh, third-party module, or uh, these little devices where you can actually interface with the computer's car's computer, and you modify it because you want it to go a little faster. Could you go to jail for that? Literally, uh, this says that you could. So, um, for me, I guess the first example I thought of was uh, if you lost a driver's license on the ground. Uh, the ground is a public ground, the public street is equivalent to a public uh, web space. And so if I lost my license, I'd want someone to uh, pick it up and either give it back to me or give, give it to an authority. And now this, with this bill, uh, before this bill, if it's not signed, we can still do that. As security researchers, we can um, help protect data. A license is a piece of data. Um, if the bill is signed and becomes law, then it, I feel that it makes picking up that license illegal. So then I don't pick it up. I leave it on the ground. Um, a person with malicious intent will probably still pick it up. And then the state of Georgia would be known for having more of this data just lying around waiting to be picked up. So I think it would cause us to be less secure than, than more secure, which is the intent. Yep. I'll inject a question. So one thing we haven't covered yet is the Internet of Things. And we all have those devices. We bring them into our homes, and we hook them up to our network. Um, when, if Senate Bill 315 becomes law, uh, what are some of the implications on, on Internet of Things devices and the security of, of Georgia people's homes? <clears throat> okay, so that uh, it, it depends. Are you trying to probe your own devices that you own? Uh, in that scenario, it's, I kind of map it back to the car, the automobile example. Uh, depending on the device manufacturer, if they put inside some type of fine print that you can't probe that device looking for security issues, then they could exploit this law. So um, that's well, let me, one. Let me, let me give you, uh, I guess, an example. You can repeat this. So you have an IoT device that's manufactured by a foreign manufacturer, and they do a very limited run because they're off to the new model. So a, secu a security researcher uh, thinks it's insecure, and they start to probe it. This device communicates with the cloud. So uh, what are the implications of being able to say, wait, this particular webcam is so insecure, you should not use it to monitor your babies, um, because of it's, it's anyone could watch the feed. What are the implications there? Well, I, th I think that you, know, you, you bring up a, good, a very good point. It, even if you're not a security researcher, you know people could stumble. You know they're technically adept. They stumble upon you know some of these uh, IoT devices are are built very you know poorly with with very little or no security in mind, and they say, well, okay, I didn't realize that I was you know putting my baby on the internet. Now they just tweet that. They they say, oh my God, look at this. This is awful. Okay, they've just now you know uh, you know told uh, you know uh, admitted to doing what's illegal in this bill. And so if that manufacturer decides they don't want to deal with, you know, pay their lawyers to do it, they just call up the Georgia prosecution's office and, and have them go arrest those people. And that is, you know, that is the, the type of, 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 you know, legal situation that we would be in. And, you know, I've had somebody kind of push back in these discussions say, Nobody's, nobody's going to abuse the law like that. I mean, that's not the intent of the law. And I've heard it from you know the people that, that frame this. It's like, well, uh, um, the DMCA, DCMA, sorry, DCMA, right? The, the, the Digital Communications Millennial Act. Did I get it right? There we go. See, I'm dyslexia bouncing around. It, that, you know, is one of the like most prime, you know, uh, examples of, of uh, you know, abuse of, of a law is that, you know, I've had, uh, there's just, you know, thousands of instances where, you know, individuals were, uh, you know, being sued for hundreds and, or thousands of dollars, uh, you know, for, you know, thinking that they were sharing uh, music videos or they posted something on YouTube. I, you know, I've got one of my Facebook videos has been taken back because I was singing along to a song. And so, you know, the, the, there is... A, there is definite precedence uh, in this in this country that we will use whatever legal means we have possible to uh, uh, you know companies will will use those to um, you know uh, to, to get the to to get the ends that they want um, and so we definitely should be 
you know, exploring the possibilities and, and not just being naive to think, ah, you know, it probably won't be abused in this way. So. I think this touches on something, and this is maybe a little bit larger than our discussion around Senate Bill 315, is that uh, that the infringement uh, on this, you know, the, the criminal violation of this particular bill, should it become law, is uh, is impacted by the scale and power of technology. So when we're using computers, they're a tool and they can be used for good or they can be used for nefarious purposes, but they augment our ability to do that. And I think what I'm hearing you say a little bit is touching on that, which is that um, the enforcement of this law can also be augmented by technology. So uh, I can imagine a situation where we, you, would, you could do some sentiment analysis on tweets and discover hey, these people are tweeting about my insecure software, so now let me turn around and uh, see if I can draw up some criminal, uh, proce uh, some criminal pro uh, prosecution towards those folks. So I think that's the other thing that's, uh, that's difficult about legislating uh, uh, technology, especially with what computers allow us to do. It takes it to a scale that we haven't perceived before. So when we talked, you, you mentioned earlier about the... Um, where the bits and bytes are coming from. And when we talk about what that scale, we're not talking about, oh, maybe we'll see 10 or 100 of those situations. It could be in the billions of situations uh, uh, that would violate this law in that case. And that's another thing that I think speaks to the, the, the uh, criminal prosecution. I heard some concerns expressed uh, at one point of, um, if I run a scan that violates this law, we're not talking about one year in jail. We're talking about 300,000 years in jail uh, should they be applied serially? So, um, uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I, I know we're getting close to time here. We've gone we've gone on for a little while. Did, um, if there are not any other questions coming from we're folks, take questions from online if there are any, and from the audience. If okay. Any. any questions from the audience? Why is the thumb not a computer? Oh, that's a great question. The question was, why is a phone not a computer? Does anybody want to take issue with that or address that? Your, your phone is a computer. Mm -hmm. It's got a processor in it. So it's definitely a computer. It picks it up under this law. Yes. Yes. Any, that's what we, we were, if you want to think about the Internet of Things and you, in defining any type of device that has computing and communication capabilities, that is a computer. So, it, it, this, um, you know, if you got a copy of the bill, you know, the Article 6, Chapter 9, Title 16. In Title 16, there's a definition section. And so, you know, the, the bill here doesn't modify any of the definitions that are there, but there is a defin legal definition of what a computer is, and, and it does cover you know, our, our phones. Uh, and, and so, in, in this instance, uh, that would be, you know, th this bill would be applied to unauthorized access, and so that would include picking up somebody's phone and 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 accessing it. What about the refrigerator? And the, yeah, and, the, and, the, and the, that's uh, coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or the, I, the the fight over the thermostat. Yeah. You know, the, the spouses fighting over the thermostat. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to you know call and have my uh, wife uh, arrested because she touched the thermostat. It was unauthorized access. I think they're the in the same household. They got the oh, car out. Oh darn. <laughs> No, I think that's a fantastic point. Is is that the phone? The phone all of a sudden uh, is is a computer, and so um, uh, you, I imagine situations where where folks access each other's phones, maybe for uh, uh, you know joking purposes to have fun. But now, now all of a sudden, technically, they're they've created a criminal. Uh, they've, they've they've created um, a criminal act by doing that and doing so. There's another, um, I've accessed a couple of people's strangers' phones. Uh, one case, they dropped it on State Street. I opened it, called the last number, and said, hey, would you like your phone back? Would you like your, would, does your friend want their phone back? Or the person you know. Another case is on a cruise ship. I found an iPhone. It was unlocked. It, had it been locked, I would have just turned it into the cruise ship. But since it was unlocked, I redialed the last number and said, hey, you know, I found this phone. He said, oh, it's my wife's phone. Thank you. I'll come get it. So I think there's, it goes back to the, like the driver's license, a phone. Um, if I lost my phone, I would definitely want it back. Well, in, in those scenarios, you know, you, the, the person that, that realizes that's not going to be pissed off and go and ask uh, the police to go arrest you, right? But, um, you know, when you were describing that, I thought about the situation. You know, I've, I've got kids in school. There's resource officers in those schools. And those resource officers, especially in high schools, have to make a determination. Did this 
particular issue break a law? And do I need to take a kid in and 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 you know arrest them for fighting for you know some you know all the different things that happen in schools? When does it cross that line and become illegal? This will enable that resource officers start pulling in uh, kids who are just grabbing one another's phones. You know, making something embarrassing, post, you know, the type of, 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 of things that happen. Um, you know, and, and that's, an, that's an aspect, you know, I hadn't really even realized that that would be, you know, another place for abuse as those individual officers having, you know, could, could you know, overuse that, that ability and, and uh, you know, start getting a lot of kids uh, arrested for this. The kids could be 18, too, still in high school. We have another question from the audience. Actually, you want to come up here and we'll let you ask? Could you guys talk a little bit about the student aspect of this bill and how it could stifle um, job seeking for, I, I mean, we have Kennesaw State University, Georgia Tech, I mean, they are teaching these courses for like ethical hacking as part of a curriculum because these are positions that will be sought after by graduates coming out of school. Uh, if that's going to be illegal to practice that kind of work in this state, we are growing students who will take their talents elsewhere and those states will benefit from from you know from our you know education system. Can you just talk a little bit about you know why that's you know not good? You know, it, it, it really kind of extends on a lot of the discussion we've had tonight about, you know, the chilling effect it's going to have on those independent security researchers. So every time we've said independent security researcher, that includes, you know, uh, students uh, of all ages, both that are going to school and the ones that are learning by themselves online. There's lots of self-driven uh, uh, education for the security market. And so, um, you know, absolutely that this is, a, you know, a, a situation that kind of exposes them. And, you you know, they either will one. You know, if they if they if they know this exists, will uh, you know be able to make a decision that I don't want to go into that field. You know, it's 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 you know you can get in trouble with the law. I don't want to go down that road, right? Um, or decide that you know I, I I could do this, but I have an opportunity to move elsewhere, and so therefore I can I can move and and still pursue this uh, line of work. Or or I think the third uh, situation would be the most tragic is they run afoul and they find out the hard way that they're that they violated uh, a statute and then find themselves in trouble. Um, and uh, especially if there was no Ill malicious intent in the first place. Exactly. <clears throat> and another aspect is what if the uh, the universities or the teaching institutes have to stop providing this coursework, period. Um, when I was at Auburn uh, back in the 90s, I, there, I could run any, there, it was a Unix-based system, and I could run any command I wanted. So I just tried running all of them, right? Because you know you you want to know what happens. Um, I think that's the, a good place to do it at the university. I ran into some that should have not been allowed, and so I let the you know admins know these should not be allowed. And I, I think that's the proper thing to do. And I think to just give students kind of an an open system and let them find vulnerabilities in it. I think that, that's a really good way to learn. And I'd like. You know, I, I gained a lot from it. I think other students would too. You know, one it made me think of a line that that you know, or something to explain to to the audience that that might not understand that that the, you know these security researchers you know that, that are doing these active uh, you know going out and trying to find vulnerabilities that that. You think about the security field, you know, if it's, you know, let's say 100,000 people or, or something along those lines, there might be some small percentage of those that are doing that security investigations and that they're security researchers that are doing that stuff. The rest of the guys are what we, uh, we, we call blue team, right? They, these are the ones that are working for the companies that are defending, um, you know, our Georgia companies from hackers all over the world. To understand how to defend yourself, you really kind of not know how the attackers attack. And so many of the time, these, these blue team folks uh, will, you know, on their own, on their own downtime, you know, look at these self-trained websites, look at these blog sites, you know, understand, you know, and try the tools and see how they work. Now, you know, and that, uh, again, 
uh, you know, by having this law in effect, uh, you know, or, uh, basically would would again put that you know chill in that to be able to you know these folks will not be able to do that stuff on their on time. You know, they have to be as part of their daily activities. You know, they couldn't do any type of extracurricular training, and and uh, you know that that whole um, you know situation just makes it to where it makes it very hard to run a security team in Georgia. Yeah, it sounds like it's raising the bar. The barrier to entry. It, it reminds me of the similar to having to have a DOD clearance in order to just get your job done, which I understand if it's for, you know, secret and confidential data. But in the case of a very fast growing field like computer, computer security, I mean, it would take, honestly, I think it would take the laws a long time to catch up to the technology. We would constantly, um, we need a lot a law that's uh, officially written so that we're not updating it every uh, however often you guys update them. <laughs> yeah, we get together once a year. <laughs> you have a couple of questions. Or you want to finish up? Nope. Okay, let me grab the microphone. This one's a long one. Thank you, Kate. So um, we have a couple of questions. One was about uh, it's that kind of a partial do CTFs. I, I, Al, I don't know. Maybe you can capture the flag. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the second question is, what is the best option for students, adults, and the public to protect themselves against their freedom of privacy against policy that works against their better interests? That is from Scott Ingram. Thank you, Scott. Anyone hear that? Yeah, no, I did. I think that you know what we're getting at is that you know um, we keep talking about the security of a company, and what we're really when we say that what we really mean is these companies hold our data. We have a you know one of the large credit monitoring firms that's a Georgia-based company. We have a large airlines. We have you know very large companies that have large databases that uh, and we entrust them with our privacy, with our private data. Um, and so when we say that uh, this bill will lower the security of Georgia companies, that means that your company, your data will be at more at, at risk of being stolen and being used by fraudsters uh, um, and so that's the real implication of this is is that you know by by you know not having uh, a uh, growing cyber security cyber security community here in, in Atlanta that the Georgia companies can can uh, you know tap into and use those expertise those companies will be at greater risk for attacks and our private information will be exposed so this is this is in essence what you know uh, you know when we say you know lower the security of a company what we're meaning is just your data that's at risk I want to add to that. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say, "Oh, but I haven't done anything. Um, I don't care." You know, if someone wants to see my data, that's okay. Um, data is an asset. You can see this in in Facebook and in Google. And and basically, if it's uh, I, basic personalized marketing. So anything that if they know your height, they know your eye color, they know your hairstyle, they know anything about you. Um, if they know your genetics, maybe they know your your you're prone to having high cholesterol. They're like, hey, these things will help lower your cholesterol. It's, a, it's just very, um, all data is pretty much marketable. Yeah, there's, there's three big companies that do this, right? Oh. Yeah, there's the tra uh, TransUnion, ex uh, Equifax, oh. and Experian. That's, that's their, that is what they do. That's their, their business is to acquire data about us as individuals and then turn around and sell that to other companies. And that's, that's their market. So yeah, this, for folks who may be not technical or not, not aware that th these folks have been doing this a long time, they've just been getting better and better at it. And they have more and more opportunities to do that now because so much of our information is online. As a quick tangent on that, um, the, the, the coined a term called inf informatics. I think that's how they pronounce it. Uh, it's the idea of that you know information is assets, but why isn't the why aren't those assets on the uh, on the business sheet on the, on the balance sheet? And so there is actually a movement with the economists and, and, and technologists that are saying, you know, we need to, you know, say that, that Google isn't the combination of their servers, it's the combination of their data. And so we're going to see in the next, you know, five to ten years where we're, we're going to start to put real dollars on, you know, our data. And, and, and so they kind of get to that understanding that this data is not only in concept, 
valuable data, but we will see it on, on public companies' uh, bottom line. So that, that's, that's, we're, we're definitely moving in that direction. So I'll ask, thank you everyone. Um, I'll just ask you, Jonathan, so you can repeat it. What I think Al uh, asked about uh, capture the flags is, uh, have those been made illegal if this bill is signed or is that somehow allowed like authorization? So the question was, are capture the flag uh, programs made illegal? And for folks who may not be familiar, this is uh, typically an opportunity where uh, where there's some type of token or flag that uh, folks are encouraged to find in a system or a system of systems, a network or a computer network, and the job is to uh, maybe find vulnerabilities, and there may be a sequence of vulnerabilities, so it takes, uh, you know, you find the first one, which is sort of easy, the second one's a little bit harder. It's almost like a, um, you know, some type of, uh, uh, I, what, what's the game you play when you do this in real life? I can't think of it off the capture top of my head. Not, not, not capture the flag, but almost like a treasure hunt, right? You know, like a type of treasure hunt, but you're doing it on the computer and you have to break the clues to find the vulnerabilities for each one. Um, Do anybody want to address his question? <clears throat> I would say this, Mike, this could be a complex answer or a complex question, both. Um, on one end, you would consider this authorized access. If, say, a university or some type, this would normally be set up by a, a conference or a training. Uh, so various conferences that I go to, Black Hat, uh, Sector, various ones, they'll have uh, capture the flag competitions where you go on site <clears throat> and various organization, organizations have set up networks of devices and students or players, competitors, whatever, can come in and, and try to hack these systems. So in that case, it would be authorized access. And so from that perspective, it should not be an issue. However, where the problem comes in is, is if they're, when you're setting up these systems, you gotta understand you're installing software or you're, you're using, um, if it's an IoT device, say a, a baby camera or a router or whatever, and you set that up in the lab <clears throat> and you're doing this with software that has known vulnerabilities in it, or sometimes unknown vulnerabilities, the question then becomes, does the, the owner of that software, the producer of that software, can they then say, okay, well, you're hacking our system. Is it then unauthorized? So that's where the complexity could, could come into play. I would not foresee that to happen, but th it is a possibility. Generally speaking, it would be probably considered authorized access as long as you're playing it in an official CTF and not, say, in a... I'm, I'm probing someone's site, and I'm going to try to find <laughs> a flag. <laughs> well, that, the assumption there is that they've set up their own Capture the Flag servers, right. and everything is, is kind of contained within one system. Um, you know, that's not always the case. A lot of times they use cloud-based services to host, you know, some of the things that they have to go out to find is out there. I've, I've been part of, there's um, uh, the, the social engineering Capture the Flags. Right? They use Facebook, Twitter. I mean, that, you know, you're you're going out and using. You know, this is not just a closed system. And so, in those cases, those capture the flag situations, yes, that this, this is you're going to be having. You're asking somebody to go and, and purposefully do, you know, uh, you know, knowingly unauthorized access on on, on public facing systems. And so, in those, and there's there's others that even expand. You know, make that line even further uh, fuzzy. Um, media companies have created little puzzles. When they go out and they're trying to engage people around the, uh, uh, you know, trying to, to watch this new film, right, is, is that they'll, they'll put little clues in their posters and they go out to their websites and they have, you know, ways. And, and they're really asking people to go and hack those, you know, look at the source code of the HTML and go in and, 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 and do some unauthorized access. And, there, you know, so there's situations that, that definitely start, it will definitely cross the line here and, and put people uh, definitely at risk. So I want to thank everybody for coming. I, this has been fascinating. So this is something that, as a, as a first-time legislator, uh, this is an issue that I've been thinking about. And it's amazing to me in, that, in this forum tonight that I've already had about at least at least four or five different things that I hadn't considered before uh, that have raised more concerns that I've had around this. Um, so I definitely want to thank you all for coming out and um, give you one last chance to wrap it up with any final, final comments or statements. I want to thank everybody who came out to this event, anybody watching online. Thank you all so much. Um, I think uh, we've, we've definitely exposed uh, more concerns around this bill and maybe some unintended side effects. Uh, I do think that this is something that we do need to address uh, and I would love to come back next year uh, with, uh, with, with you all's help to create craft maybe some finer language that would be a little bit clearer and sort of address some of the concerns that we've raised here. But let me turn it over to you, each one of you and give you a chance to, to wrap up and say anything you might want to at the very end. 
Charles Sarta. So, you know, I think that, you know, what we're doing is urging the governor to please veto this bill. Um, the, um, the, the legal gap that we've got with this uh, not having a law that make, you know, makes unauthorized access a, a, a state, uh, you know, misdemeanor is a, is a very small gap. It's something that we need to close up, but there is not a large amount of activity that isn't also covered by federal law uh, that is uh, need for need for you to sign something that is fraught with so many errors uh, that the amount of work to try to fix this and clean it up and the time uh, between now and then uh, you know uh, is is there isn't enough uh, um, reason to go ahead and sign this as is so you know please consider all of the the uh, the problems with the bill as it's currently written we will get this right next uh, session so uh, please veto it. Thank you. Uh, so computer security, cybersecurity is actually one of the most challenging problems we are facing nowadays. And um, it, it's, it's, it, it's only going to get worse uh, as we have more and more technology. And so just, just simply to say that, you know, uh, you can address such a complex problem in two pages is just not sufficient. I would love to see a lot more uh, detail go into this uh, potentially with um, based off of significant input from technolo technological experts who understand this a lot more in depth. Uh, first I want to say thank you uh, Mr. Jonathan Wallace and thank you Mr. Frank Riata for um, hosting this and I if you also have concerns about this bill you can write uh, Governor Deal a letter. Um, anyone can write a letter. Um, I wrote a letter. I, so, and also you can encourage your, if you work for a software company, you can encourage their company to write uh, a letter to him as well to urge him to veto it and post on social media. And thank you for listening. And one more time, I want to say thanks to Big Nerd Ranch for allowing us to host the event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>